Imagine for just a moment that you spent your entire adult life deceiving and manipulating other human beings. You know, they say that to perfect any skill, you have to put in over 10,000 hours of practice to do so. Boy, I have definitely put in my time. Now imagine that one day you wake up and you realize that you're the person that's being deceived. Wow, you're talking about mind-blowing. You see, it's kind of an oxymoron, but I'm an honest liar. I entertain and deceive now for the purpose of making you laugh, amazing you, and making you go, wow. I'm going to pull back the curtain on real deception and introduce you to the real deceiver. Ladies and gentlemen, the performer you're about to see has performed across the country and around the world. You've seen him on all the late night talk shows, and most recently he's been featured on the travel channels Seeing Versus Believing, where millions witnessed his amazing ability. Well, there you go. Cut it off right in the middle. <laughs> we, just to let you know, full disclosure, they, they were supposed to cut that off. It wasn't supposed to be a big grandiose entrance. That clap was for the Lord. Let's give him another praise offering. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Barbara and I. I didn't say it in the first uh, service, but we, I did thank Pastor Mark and Lisa, but we also uh, thank our friends, uh, Don and Roxy Price, who originally introduced us uh, and brought us together uh, with uh, Pastor and, and, and Lisa. And um, also we want to thank the Diamonds who we stayed at their house. They allowed us to stay uh, in their little house, their tiny house. Is that what you call it? It was really, it was amazing. I've never been in a tiny house before. And I thought being six foot three, it was going to be some situation. And the top uh, regular floor was fine until I went up the stairs. And then I had to literally get like this. The ceiling was right here. So, um, wow, it was, it's an experience, but it was so sweet and kind of them to serve us like that. Um, so, having said that, I know a lot of you are probably wondering right off the bat, why, Pastor, do we have a guy that has performed his entire career in casinos all across the country and around the world here on the church pulpit? And I would refer you to a story in the Bible about a gentleman named Balaam who had a jackass. And the jackass spoke to Balaam. Never questioned God. He could be using another jackass again. <laughs> so bear with me today because this is a little different. Now, when I generally do a show, even when I was here uh, for the Pillars Group, I would do my show, and then I would take 10 or 15 minutes and give a testimony. We're doing the complete and total opposite of that. But I thought that after speaking to my wife and some friends here, that it would be important to share, to let you know what it is that I do. What does a mentalist do? So I, I brought some large cards with me. I call these the senior citizen cards. <laughs> and uh, people that don't see well will know what that means. Now, I have never met this gentleman in the hat. Have I correct, sir? Never met you. And um, what is your first name? Matt. Matt. Matt, would you mind coming up here and giving me a help? Give him a round of applause. You, Matt, come right over here. <laughs> Stairs, Matt. He, he was just going to try to come right up here, wasn't he? Is that, is that your husband? No. <laughs> well, that was fast. Wow. And you too, huh? Matt, nice to meet you. How are you? Come right over here, Matt. Look at, man, that's a beard. I, I just have to check one thing. Wow, you got hair too. Wow. It's usually always the complete opposite. They got all of this here and then nothing up here. So these are all different cards, as you can see. And they're big cards, Matt. Is it, Matt, right? It is impossible for me 
Oh, it is impossible for me to hide these cards in my hand. There's not a person in this room that would have trouble seeing that card if I was trying to hide it. So I'm going to ask you to stand right over here, Matt, and I'm going to let the cards, and I've been mixing them all up the entire time. I don't know the order, and you don't know the order. Notice anyone in the audience. And I'm going to let the cards go like this. And in a moment, you're just going to do it. When I do it again, you're going to touch the back of any card that you feel comfortable with, okay? Anyone that you feel comfortable with. All right. Are you happy? Yeah. Now listen close. <laughs> if you feel uncomfortable and that I somehow manipulated you to stop there, you can tell me I want another card and change your mind. But keep in mind, if you do change your mind, Matt, that could change the entire outcome about what's going to happen. <laughs> if you don't change your mind, that could change the entire outcome of what's going to happen. <laughs> that card, don't let me see it. Hold it close to your body. That's different. They're all different cards. Now we're going to use 52 different cards. And I'm going to come down there and we'll have the camera that will follow me. I'm going to come down there on the level of the folks. Now there are 52 cards here and these cards will be shuffled. It doesn't really make a difference that we're going to do that. But I'm going to show the camera right here that we're shuffling those cards, right? You can see that they're they're all shuffled up. I'm going to ask a uh, young gentleman here on the third row with the blonde hair, pinkish kind of shirt. Would you stand right here for me, sir? I'm going to give you some cards. What's your name? Reed. Reed. Perfect. Pay very close attention for me. Reed. Would you mind helping out? You don't mind? Okay. You can stand right here. All right. There you go. And uh, here, I'll give you some cards. And you can stand over there. Three people have cards. Here's what's going to happen. In a moment, I'm going to say go. Whenever I say go, these three people are going to start handing cards out face down to people in the audience randomly. All right? When they do that, the person that receives the card won't give the card to anyone. And they won't look at the card. They'll place it between their hands and they will stand up and remain where they're seated. But stand up. All right? You won't look at the card and know what it is. They won't know what it is. Fair? Very important. When I say go, you can start right now, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is important, if not imperative, that you do not look at the card. Please stand up the very moment that you get the card. Perfect. Do not share the card. Don't let anyone else see it. Don't look at the card yourself. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect. I'm going to go back up here. Excellent. No, I'm not because I have to read the people. I'll go when I'm finished. Excellent. How are we doing? Reed, how old are you? 20? Yeah, I picked you because you're pretty young. You're moving like you're 90. I mean, this guy... <laughs> This guy looked like a gerbil during the praise and worship. And I thought, he's going to do great. He's praising the Lord. He's got energy. And then he walks like he's, he's 90 years old. Look at him. He's still going like that. Look at him. Come on, Ray. Chop, chop. <laughs> How's he? Where's the other young lady? Are oh, you through? You finished. Read the girl beat you. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Have a seat. You did awesome. All right, we all done? The hard part now comes. Matt, do you know what your card is? Oh, Matt, that's real important that you know that. Look at the card for me, please. Don't show anyone, but make sure you know what the card is. Now, Matt, here's the thing. You know what it is. I have to read you. You had two chances to change your mind, and you declined both those chances. Look at me and focus on the color. It's either red or black. 50-50. But everything he's doing right now tells me what I need to know. That moving like he's rocking to music and there's no music at all. <laughs> but that's nerves. Concentrate on the suit. Diamond club, heart or spade. Diamond club, heart or spade. Perfect. Concentrate if it's a number card, a face card, or an ace. Number, face, or an ace. Perfect. 
That's the hard part. Matt, now I'll do the hardest part. In under a minute and 10 seconds, I'm going to read 52 people that I've never met in my life. You need to know now what your card is. Please look at your card for the first time. Don't share any with anyone around you. Know your card, and I'll start right now. Have a seat. Have a seat, sir, please. LF hat, have a seat. Gentleman in the blue shirt, have a seat. Young man, young lady, have a seat. Children are very hard to read. Under the age of 19, their frontal lobe is not developed yet. Um, a lot of adults, don't worry, there's neither. <laughs> and, but um, at that age, you haven't, and it's really hard to read you. She's your daughter, right? You don't know what she's thinking 90% of the time, do you? Look at me, have a seat, 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 have a seat. Oh, the nice lady, keep standing. Sir, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat back there. Gentleman shirt, have a seat. A hat, the green shirt, have a seat. You have a seat. The lady in the red, white, and blue, have a seat. The blue, the gray, have a seat. The gentleman, have a seat. Uh, uh, two folks together there, have a seat. The gentleman, the lady, the lady, have a seat, have a seat. Have a seat, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Perfect. Folks over here, have a seat. Two folks together. The nice lady, could you stand up? Oh, you are standing. I'm sorry. Or um, I couldn't see you. I apologize. Have a seat. Um, you, sir, have a seat. Uh, have a seat, sir. Have a seat. Have a seat. Oh, are you Spanish? Mexico? Okay. Would, would it help if I spoke Spanish also? Yeah, I wish I could. Um <laughs> The Lord hadn't blessed me with that yet. Have a seat, 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 have a seat. Oh, stay standing. Have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Wow, I did that actually quicker than usual. <sighs> Lady in blue, stay standing. Lady in gray, have a seat. Lady in white, have a seat. Focus on the color of the card, sir. Look at me. Folk, I want to get this right. I open every show that I do, no matter where it is, across the country, around the world. It gives me an idea how the show is going to go. Because when this works, it is absolutely unbelievable. When it doesn't work, it stinks. <laughs> Have a seat, sir. Join me on stage with Matt. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan. R Y A N? Yes, sir. You can have a stand, stand right here. Face the audience, both of you, please. You had no idea that you were going to be up here today, did you? I can tell. You were looking, you were perusing your card earlier. I could see you. That means to look. No, 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 no. I was saying that peruse. Well, no, I don't mean to be condescending anywhere I'm at, but when I'm doing this, I always am aware that people in the audience are from all across the country, from coast to coast, around the world, Arkansas. <laughs> so you never really know. I'm gonna say go. And when I say go, you're both going to hold your cards up and they're going to do a tight shot in of your cards. Okay? One, two, three, go. Is that it? Perfect, perfect. Give them a round of applause. You did a great job. Keep your card. Thank you very much, Ryan. Keep that. So I thought it was important today to start off so you knew what I was and what I did. Seven years ago, around seven years ago, I was at the peak of my career. I was performing at the world's largest casino. My name was in a marquee, on a marquee, as it had been many, many times. And life was going great. And one day in my office, I heard, I felt, I heard, it's hard to explain in my spirit, these words. You've done it your way long enough, it's time to do it my way now. I didn't have a clue what that meant, and I blew it off. I actually looked around in the office thinking that somebody was pranking me at it because I thought I heard it audibly. 
That's how clear it was. Six months goes by. I'm back in the office, almost the exact same place. And I hear it sterner. I said, you've been doing it your way long enough. It's time to do it my way. And I just said, Lord, if this is you, tell me. Now, I have to tell you this, that I grew up in a church, in a Christian family. And I knew God's word. And as a young boy, I'd given my heart to the Lord. But at that point, I had never submitted my will to Christ. And as a typical Pentecostal, I didn't dance, I didn't smoke, and I didn't drink. So those three made me a good Christian. Forget all the other things. I could make a, create a reason for those, justify it. So I said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do. And more and more it became evident that he wanted me to create this program called The Deceiver for churches. And it would look like this. I would perform for 45 minutes and then I would do a 10 to 15 minute uh, testimony. Now, having said that, I put it on the back burner. A year later, I came home from a show in Las Vegas and I'd just gotten in a really bad argument with my wife. And I was getting up on our ladder. We had two. I chose the bad one. I didn't get up on the one that we paid a lot of money for so I would never fall off. And my hobby was gardening. When I was home, it helped me to just relax and unwind and I just didn't think. And I'm up pruning these holly bushes. And all of a sudden, I said, you know, this is the wrong ladder. I threw away the shear, electric shears, and I went to get off the ladder and I fell six feet in this position. My head here, my feet up here. My wife loves to build things. She's handy. Most guys get their wives perfume, jewelry. I bought my wife an arc welder for Christmas. <laughs> Every man's dream, right? <laughs> she had a five-gallon bucket at the edge of our garage where I was pruning the hollies. It was concreted, and in the middle of it was a PVC pipe so she could put metal pipe down into it. And the PVC pipe was cut at an angle, like not round, but like a spear to hold it when she welded. And I fell onto that. And I still have the hole in my back. But it didn't penetrate, which was a mystery I'll get to in a moment. I immediately fell on the ground. I was wrenching in pain. I was, I was crying out, Barbara, I'm hurt. Something's wrong. I'm hurt. I crawled, made my way up the stairs in the garage and I got to the, the kitchen. Barbara was in doing something. And she immediately came over to me, couldn't get off the ground. She put her hands on my back and she began to pay, pray in the spirit. And I began to get erect, stand up straight. And the pain started to subside, but it's still there. And she said, I believe that God has healed you, but we're going to go to the ER just to make sure. We did. Got there and the doctor says, uh-oh. He says, there's going to be some major damage. We explained what had happened from that grade of a fall. My head didn't hit. It went forward and popped it like on a roller coaster. Did all the MRIs, did the CAT scans. And he came back and he closed the door. And I was like, oh, Lord. And he said, first of all, I've never seen anything like this. This should have gone through your body. It should have impaled you. Your wife should have found you. It should have gone through your spine, severed your spine. You shouldn't even be walking. He said, but I don't understand. There's a big hole that's cutting it. We've got it stopped and bleeding. But I did every scan that we could possibly do. And there's no issue. Zero issue. For the next week or two, as I healed, we had a big show in, in Celebration Florida coming up at celebrity uh, fundraiser event that I've been going to, we've gone to for 20 years. I was doing the show that week. We were in rehearsals. So this, going forward two weeks, we're in rehearsals. All of a sudden, after rehearsal, we're going to lunch, and my left eye started getting all these little worms and threads, thousands, and I freaked out. And my wife said again, just calm down, and it went away after an hour and became gray film. 
Two days later, we get on a plane, go back to Dallas. Should have listened to my wife when she said, let's go to the doctor now. I didn't. Typical. And when we got back, the doctor, orthopedic, the orthodontist, or not the ortho, the um, ophthalmologist said, I'm getting you to the surgeon right now, the retinal surgeon. We went over to him. He did a stapling deal to try to reattach my retina, and three days later, it had detached again. So he scheduled me for surgery. Went and had the surgery, put the bubble in, and it holds the retina, and it dissipates because it's gas. Within three weeks, it had detached again. After three failed surgeries, they put in a solid oil, silicone oil bubble to hold the retina because I had 20-20 vision in the eye. But if I do this, I can't see it. Oh, I can't see anything. My bad. I can't see anything at all. Now, you can imagine what this would do to a person that makes his living with sleight of hand. And it destroyed and wrecked me. And for three nights, at one point, I never slept. I had total insomnia. I was on my knees those three days. On my knees, crying out to God, asking God. But I was doing it the wrong way. I was asking him why. Because again, I still had not submitted my will to him. When I did submit my will, the request totally changed. It went from a why and a pitiful excuse to how. God, how can I serve you? How can I use this to glorify your name? And then the deceiver took off. And that's what brings us here today. I had a friend, and my wife reminded me that I didn't share this earlier, in the nine o'clock. A friend of mine that's not a believer in Las Vegas, and he said to me one day, I bet you'd give anything, anything to be able to get back on that ladder. This is when you know that God's done a work. When you say something, you don't know where it came from. You do, but at the time you don't. I looked at him and I said, can I be honest? If I would have stayed on the same trajectory of where I was going spiritually, I would rather go ahead and keep the physical loss of my vision because God gave me spiritual vision. So the thing that I want to share with you today, I made some notes and forgive me, and I want to tell you one more thing, that you really need to be so thankful that you have such an amazing pastoral team. What I have gone through in the last two or three weeks to a month to prepare for a less than 30 minute, now 15 minute speech or sharing with you my heart It's unbelievable. The edits, the changes. I used to think that it was so easy to be a minister and come up here and speak for 30 minutes twice a week. Let me tell you what, it's not. So you bear with me and you keep him in your prayers. And Lisa also. The art of causing, I better get my glasses because I only have the one eye. And let me tell you something else that's crazy. Satan will still go after you when you're down. You think that after he'd done all he can do, about three weeks, a month ago, I had to go to the optometrist because now I've just got the one eye. And I had a corneal scratch. So they have to put a white, because I don't feel anything. Oh, by the way, I'm totally numb from this side of my face all the way over from a pre-existing thing called trigeminal neuralgia that killed the nerve, but it also killed all of the nerve in the right side of my face. So I have to worry about dirt or dust getting in there and not rubbing it because I don't feel it. Satan has his way. The art of deception. If you look in the Webster's Dictionary, it's very, very simple. The art of deception is causing someone to accept truth and valid what is false and invalid. Now, when I looked this up in the dictionary, it blew my mind that they prefaced deception with art. When you think about art or an artist, for instance, someone that you'll all know, George Strait. Country music artist. It's taken him his entire career to get to the level he is and master it. Uh, Picasso, Rembrandt, uh, Luciano Pavarotti, the opera singer. It takes years and years to develop those skill sets. And when you think about a liar, a thief, a con man, a con artist, 
So it is amazing me to me that deception is classified as an art. But who's been practicing it since the beginning of time? The true deceiver. It is the basis and the root of all sin. The very first lesson that we learn, and I find this absolutely amazing, the first lesson that we learn in God's word is about deception. It's about Adam having a maid Eve and Satan going around Adam and going to Eve and saying, go ahead and bite the fruit, eat the fruit. You won't die, you'll live. Your eyes will be open. I believe that the greatest deception is that sin has no consequence. It was always when Satan told her, do it, just do it. The second one is that a human can be equal to God. This is what he promised her. She would be equal to God. When I worked for a company and they would bring me in a corporate group called Raytheon. They brought me in there to deliver an engaging presentation to get the attention of possible engineers to work with NASA. These people were so smart. After my show, four and five degreed men and women would come up to me. And by the way, I open every show I do with I'm not a magician. I don't read minds. I'm not a psychic. I don't believe in those things. I'm an entertainer. What I'm going to do is going to make you believe I have a gift, but I, it's not. It's manipulation. And I would have these brilliant men and women come up to me after the show, literally, and say, how long have you had this gift? I said, did you not listen to the beginning of the show? No, 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 I did, but how long have you had the gift? I said, I don't. It's pure entertainment. And they would say to me, and I, I assure you this, I believe that you're lying to me. I think you have a gift, but I think you downplay it because you fear that the U.S. government will get you and start doing experiments <laughs> on your mind. I found out quickly that they were so unbelievably genius and smart that they had zero common sense. <laughs> Those people clapping the loudest probably have common sense. They're harder to fool. Why? But common sense people are harder to fool. Basic people. Because they haven't bought into the lie of second guessing. Don't ever believe. Second guess. But how many of us as Christians and believers second guess God? Think we're geniuses. When Satan told her, just eat the fruit. Just do it. You see, in... In growing up in the early 60s, and I don't remember that because I was in the early 60s, but they called it the time of free love. And free love, what did it get us? Free disease, fever blisters, who knows? But sin has consequence. Started back in the 60s, just do it, feel good. God's word in Ecclesiastes 1 and 10, King James Version, if there is anything new, wherefore... It may be said, see, this is new, has already been, been of old time, which was before us. Now, what that means in layman terms, there's nothing new under the sun. But I will argue to you now, as a purveyor of deception for a living, man has learned how to take what was old, still the same, but nowadays make it even more wicked. An example of that, man being God in his life. Man in his infinite wisdom, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but I have to say this. There's only two pronouns, he and she. You young people are getting hammered at school. Oh no. There's, there's a thousand of them. It's half the alphabet or more now. Here's what's sad with our kids at school. They're being told in their little groups, in their cliques, if you don't accept, now think about this, if you don't accept what our belief is, then you're, full, you're, you're hateful. We're the ones that are hateful. My buddy Don gave me a good example of it. He said, if there was a crazy guy in the middle of the street would you look at him and go, hey, brother, I'm praying for you. 
Because he's crazy. He doesn't know what he's doing. No, you'd go out there and you'd do something that you needed to do and pull him back in. Kids, listen to me. And this is real important. And I mean anybody under the age of 21. You don't love or truly help anybody when you change God's word to appease a culture. Used to call them enablers when I was growing up. That's an enabler. He enables you. Now they've dressed it up. And that's what Satan does so well. Deceiving us. Influencers. You got guys that are duck hunters. And they'll tell you, this is the best call. Or these are the best camos. Or this is the best beef jerky to have when you're out there freezing your businesses off. (laughs) Now they have moms helping with new babies. And I think that's fantastic, sharing information. But now... The influencers are in school. They're in school. We have men and women who believe they know what's best for your children. And they do it secretly. You know what? I'm going to work with you. Don't share this with your mom and dad. But I believe you're better off as this. Or you're better off as that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. There's no greater sin than people that become God in their own lives and step back and say, you know what, God? You made a mistake. I'll take it from here. Every single interview I have watched on news or read in a, in a publication has started off the very same way. And I encourage you, look it up. It starts out the same way. I. I think I need to be I think I need to change. I've been living in the wrong body. I need, I, I, I. It's unbelievable. People ask me all the time, David, this is is a little depressing. It's overwhelming. How do you battle this deception? The good news is this. Luke 10 and 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all all of the powers of the enemy and nothing in any way shall hurt you. God has given us the authority and it's in prayer. I fully believe, young people, that we are to love these people and show them through examples. But when they say to you, if you don't agree with me, it's their way or the highway. How, how are they respecting what you believe? I had a friend one time in Vegas. I said, if you go out on the strip and you go 100 miles an hour, they're going to arrest you and throw you under the jail. Why? He says, because we have laws. I said, me too. They're called God's laws. And I have to obey that book. And you need to respect me. Not in our culture. But guys, girls, when they tell you that at school and they say it's my way or the highway, tell them, well, you know what? It's not even my way or the highway. It's God's way. And he's going to judge you. I don't have to. I'll love you. But it is important to know that you cannot allow them to believe that you condone what they are doing. It's time to, it's time to in, a, in a way, I guess, to, to, to man up. And the last thing that I want to do is address the men. Before I address the men, I didn't do something that I did in the early service. And I want to do that now. Because I talked about mastering deception and I've worked in my entire life. Has anybody got a $1 bill that I can borrow as I finish up? $1 bill. Boy, you're digging fast. Look at them. Matt, who are you pointing to? You don't have, any, you don't have a dollar, Matt? But she, oh, she's got one. I'm sorry. Come forward. You know what? Hold on. I'm going to buy your dollar. What's your name? Jasmine. Jasmine. Thank you, Jasmine. So we're going to get a, where do, I, where do I need to be? You're right here? Okay. Watch close. When I was first starting out, mastering the art of deception, there were two things that I had to work on, physiological deception and psychological deception. And at the beginning, and you saw in the video, it talked about the 10,000 hours, and this is what I did. Everything I practiced had to look natural. So just the very folding of this bill had to look natural. And it literally took hours of going over in it, making it look natural. 
and then I would fold it. So I started out folding the bill in half, and then I would fold it into fourths, and then I would fold it into eighteenths, and it never leaved your, your sight, and that's sixteen. And when I open it up, it had to have created the illusion at that point that the dollar had transformed itself into a $100 bill. Now, it took me months, days, weeks, years to develop that because all along I had to practice the verbal deception and the psychological by reinstating to you what was happening. Now, Jasmine, right now, a lot of you are wondering and you're going, wow, how did that happen? Jasmine's thinking I'm about to be blessed. But Jasmine, I bought this dollar from you. I bought this dollar from you. You know that I did. And you saw that I did. But just like in the very first one, this very first one, there's a lady sitting one, two, three, four rows back with a blue jean jacket. What is your name? Tiffany, are these your children? They are. Your three children. Awesome. Would you send your little boy up here, please? What is your name? Porter. Porter. Wow. I had, I've only met one other Porter, and that was Porter Wagner in Nashville. You ever heard that name? I feel old right now. Lord, I feel old. All right. But I, but I bet you've heard of Johnny Carson. David Letterman. No. No. All right, listen. Take this $100, and I want you to have your mom make sure that you tithe on it. All right? That's for you, a blessing for you. But more importantly, I want you to get some history lessons. All right? It's real important, all right? You keep that. You want to feel old, start mentioning people that you knew growing up. (laughs) Husbands, as I finish, men. There are two words that I absolutely despise in this culture. The first one is called inclusivity. Sounds great, doesn't it? But it's that same thing, your way or the highway. And the second thing that I just despise is that they are stripping men in this country and around the world of their masculinity. Now, let me me preface this. Toxic masculinity. If you're a man, if you do manly things, what do I mean by that? If you lead your family and you stand up and you believe in God's word. And to me, manhood is defined in God's word by a man that is willing to submit his will to Christ. And as I've addressed several times, just like Pastor Mark has Lisa, Barbara, that's what she is for me. And if you have a godly wife and you have a godly relationship, that's the greatest thing that you can have. You're gonna raise a godly family and you're gonna pray for those kids. I, I wish my parents We're alive today. So they could see that their prayers did not die when they did. My dear friend in Shreveport, Daryl Barrow, her mother was like a godly mother to all of us growing up. Don can tell you. And she told me, John David, when your parents died, their prayers did not die. They were at the feet of Christ. Never give up on praying for your family. Men, be kingdom men. God always knows the answer to the question. And when he went into the garden and he looked for Adam and Eve and he said, where are you? I'm asking you men and women and children today, where are you? God is saying it again. And as I finish now, one last point. This altar, in my opinion, by the deceiver, has been demonized in church. 
Let me explain what I mean. When I was going through my surgeries, Barbara would tell me, get up and go down and get prayer before your surgery. I didn't do it. I was filled with arrogance and pride. My ego wouldn't allow me. And you know why? Because I was worried about what people would think. I don't want to think I'm not a Christian. I'm a Christian. It was pride. We've been deceived to believe this is an area just for people that need Christ in redemption. It's the altar. It should be filled every Sunday with people that need healing, people that need God's touch, people that need help economically. Take it to Christ. Take it to him. He wants you to come to him. Give him those burdens. It should be full. So my prayer is that not only God opens your heart today to the fact of how easily we are deceived. I deceive people and make a living from it by making them laugh and go, wow, and amazing. That's amazing. In question, the great deceiver deceives you every single day for the purpose of stealing eternal life from you. Don't let him win. I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing, amazing church family. I'm asking that you begin to move in this service, that you would touch hearts, Lord, open eyes, open ears, so that they have no pride. Let them become kingdom men, kingdom husbands, kingdom wives, young people. Lord, protect our young people. They need, they need you more than ever. I'm asking to say today, Lord, that you will fill this altar with people that want to rekindle their relationship or are being deceived right now and bring it to you, bring it to the cross, bring it to the altar and let it go. Lord, I ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Are y'all glad we had David here with us today? Can we thank him one more time? Let's give it up for David. So I was thinking about this this morning when he was uh, giving his message to us about being deceived. And it's really funny to me that most of us have a belief in our hearts that we can't be deceived. And the reality is every one of us has the potential of it. Every one of us. It happens probably more than you actually think. I had a couple in my office quite a few years ago. We were still in that building over there. My office was in the back and they were sitting there on my couch and we were talking and you know, they were, you know, telling me why this was this way or this was that way and going on and on. And I can just tell that this is a couple that's totally deceived in what they believe, what they believe about each other, what they believe about everything else that's going on. And I just finally, I looked at the young lady who was there on my couch and I said, hey, I don't mean this ugly. I'm not trying to be mean. I just need you to understand something. You're deceived. You're totally deceived right now. And she made this statement back to me. She goes, I'm not deceived. I'm not deceived. If I were deceived, I'd know it. <laughs> and I've used that illustration over and over again because here's, that's the definition of deception. The definition of deception is if you're deceived, you don't know it. Some of you this morning, you're sitting in your chair. You've sat here at different services at different times. And the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, now, a little small, tender whisper inside of your heart. You should go for prayer. You should go and ask another brother to pray for you. You should go and ask for another sister to pray for you. And you denied it because there's another voice that's there that says, if you do it, people are going to see you. They're going to notice you. They're going to wonder why you're going up there. Don't you know you're a person of influence? But you know your position. What do you think people are going to think of you if they go if you go to the front? And we'll listen to the voice that keeps a separation between us and God over the voice that's so small, so tender, so caring, so loving, and we won't obey God. And I want to challenge you today. If you're here today, maybe you're here and you've never met Jesus. I had a couple quite a few years ago. I was asking them, I said, tell me your story. Tell me about... When did you come to know Jesus as Savior? And this was their statement. Both of them. There's a couple. They said, oh, we've always known Jesus. I said, okay, yeah, but tell me, when did, when did you invite Jesus to come into your heart? Oh, we've never had to do that. I've been a believer since I was born. Okay, 
Listen to me. We're not born believers. We're born again believers. Meaning there's one birth and then there has to be a second birth to get into his kingdom. And so maybe you're here today and you've been deceived about, well, I've, I've always been a Christian. Do you realize there has to be a moment where you come and put faith in him? Maybe you're here today and you've never done that. Today could be the day of salvation for you. Or maybe, you know, you've had a, you know, some kind of health issue. I still believe in a God who does miracles. I have watched God do miracles. And you haven't come to him because you thought, well, he won't do it for me. But if he's saying to you, if you just come to me, I would take care of that. Here's what I want to say to you. Maybe you said, well, I've come before. And then the voice is saying, don't ever go again because it didn't work the first time. Listen, I would never stop. I'm just talking about in prayer. Why would you ever stop coming to him? Because he's got an answer for you. And sometimes he's waiting to see how persistent are you. I want to challenge you. Maybe you have a marriage situation and you think, well, God can never heal my marriage. Listen, we have a God who can restore anything. Let's not stop praying about it. If you need prayer today for any reason, I'm going to close with one last prayer. Our, altar, our worship team is going to sing and we're going to worship the Lord. But let's not leave here today till we've done business with God. By the way, let me tell you, can I tell y'all, I, I didn't say this in the first service. Can I tell you one big area of deception? Uh, you know, we come to the end of a service like this and we think to ourselves, I can sneak out and I won't be a distraction to everybody else. Hey, can I ask you to do something today? Let's not sneak out. I, I got to beat all the traffic out of here. Okay, that's Satan telling you, you got to beat all these people out of here. Listen, we're a church. We're a group of people who love the Lord. Let's not run out of the doors today. Let's give people an opportunity to meet with Jesus. And it may be you. You might be the one that God's saying, come to me, and you're thinking, I need to run. Let's stop running away, and let's start running to him. So if you need prayer today, I want you to come. Are you ready? Father God, I love you. We bless your holy name. I pray for every person in this room, for every decision that's made Holy Spirit, would you minister to homes, to families, to marriages? Father, would you minister to those people who've been uh, without, they've had lack in their life? God, would you help them to realize you're a plenteous God? God, for healing, be in this room today. Holy Spirit, come right now. Meet us right where we are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.